Good afternoon. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading from Romans 8, verses 18 through 25. And that's first of, one of first of Paul's letters, and it's wedged right between Acts and 1 Corinthians. So again, that is Romans 8, 18 through 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of God for the people of God, so together we say, Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, word made flesh, I am not even worthy to untie your sandals, yet it is you who calls me and makes me worthy to be able to proclaim your word. I am humbled because without you, none of this would be possible. It would simply be another performance. So I ask that you transform our hearts, our minds, and our spirits, and to make this a divinely inspired act of worship. Amen. It's getting to the point where I can't even turn on the news or read a newspaper anymore. Yesterday, I was sitting at my computer and pulled up the latest news website to find huge black lettering that was screaming to me with, with articles such as, Saudi Arabia executes 47 people. Floods, missing teens body found. Gunmen attack Indian air bases. Syrian bombings. Come, Lord Jesus. These words are prayed over refugees in search of homes. Come, Lord Jesus, echoes from the hearts of nations as children's stomach echoes the pangs of hunger. Come, Lord Jesus, is whispered through the lips of an ashamed pregnant teenager. But what do we do when come, Lord Jesus, is sounded as bombs drop in the form of lost job, lost income, lost home, lost dignity, lost hope. With all the bad news we encounter on the internet, street newsstands, or the television, reading the headlines in the checkout lane at the local grocery store can seem a bit confusing. With the top-ranking magazines such as Better Homes and Gardens, Good Housekeeping, and Cosmopolitan, it seems we tend to stoically brush away our silent tears before allowing ourselves to realize that we, friends, are suffering. We are escaping through lives lived following a religion of successful stoicism. We silently suffer through a facade of manicured mistakes without even considering that this is not a season of finality. This is not a season of perfection. And while publicly it is easy to see our world in a state of suffering, we try to deafen deforming aspects of our lives by reading how to get fit fast or 50 ways to please your man and we Photoshop our social media profiles and succumb to the temptation of binding our shame and loss of dignity in books titled Isolation and 100 Ways to Face It Alone. It is through this that we often forget the, excuse me, often forget the world we were born into. But the truth is God did not create us to do anything alone, but promised a hope of companionship from the beginning. See, it was in the beginning that he declared isolation as not good and companionship as very good. Through this relationship, God sought a beginning to vulnerability, and that vulnerability was marred with shame, and shame was introduced. Because you see, isolation and shame are fast friends whose favorite pastime is instilling fear and stifling hope. And it is through this hope that the enemy twists as something that we must create. Hope, friends, 
was already created in the form of Christ's sacrifice, which echoed and still echoes David's song, no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. When Christ took on all the shame and all of our groaning to give us a hope that unless the Holy Spirit fills, the human spirit fails. Although he knows the hope of Christ, Paul also acknowledges suffering. We cannot escape suffering through popular magazine articles or living pristine looking lives set apart by price tags and designer labels. Our hope is not in keeping our husbands or wives pleased, our bodies beautiful, but it is in being vulnerable with our suffering, with our darkest places through the groaning together, that hope becomes tangible. We come together as the foretaste of the promise of God. As one church, we realize that we are in a poverty-stricken, war-torn, rape-cultured, white-privileged world, but it is the one church that we as a body look to Christ as our head, taking our wounds to the cross, allowing Christ to bear our burdens, and the Holy Spirit to give us patience in this time of suffering. The titles the Bible gives the Holy Spirit, intercessor, helper, counselor, comforter, show us that there will be problems. There's going to be suffering. But instead of escaping suffering for our time, hardening our hearts towards God's outstretched hands and the empathetic hearts of others, what if we instead open our hearts and minds to the very same power that out of nothing created life, out of the dust created life, filled Sarah's barren womb with life, Mary's virgin womb with life, and from the cross to the tomb, Christ overcame our death, death so that he might give us his life. As Paul explains in his letter, just as a woman groaning in labor pains, we are waiting for a time when all of creation and our entire body is redeemed. When suffering both worldwide and personally is put to an end. Our God welcomes us as his adopted children. Grieving as we grieve. Groaning as we groan. Looking forward to the day when all are redeemed and set free from suffering it is by looking forward to that day that we can consider all of this suffering as horrific as it is, as not even worth to comparing to what is ahead. We can look forward to a day and truly consider it, not just switch to a different TV show, a different conversation, a different magazine article, when suffering becomes real but that the hope in what is ahead in Christ is more present and real than suffering ever could be. And yes, it's impossible to even comprehend a time when the worst of suffering is simply a memory. But we have a hope that we do not have to work for that brings peace beyond all of our understanding. That when we say, come, Lord Jesus, come, he has already, he already is, and we have a promise that he will come exceeding all expectations, filling all hunger pangs, filling all desires with a satisfaction only received by a hope already given. And so we say, Amen. Amen.